Thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Steve McMenamin, and I'm from Indian Harbor. I'm your host for today's event, which is part of the ongoing series of the Greenwich Roundtable. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Standard & Poor's and Paul Aronson uh, for sponsoring today's event. And um, Paul, would you like to say anything to the group? Thank you, Steve. Good morning. Uh, I'd just like to say uh, that uh, Standard & Poor's is delighted to uh, really begin its, uh, its relationship with the Greenwich Roundtable. Uh, this is our, our first sponsorship of, uh, of a session. Um, as many of you may know, uh, Standard & Poor's uh, involvement in the alternative investment space is relatively new, uh, beginning with our introduction of our hedge fund index uh, last year. And uh, we are uh, delighted to begin this relationship, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, uh, a, long, a long future of uh, mutual benefit. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Pa Paul and his group will be reviving our journal, the Greenwich Roundtable Quarterly, so stay tuned for that. Um, I I'd also like to thank the Bruce Museum for their continued support. Our topic this morning, the mathematics of investing, is a follow-up on a session titled Mathematics, Common Sense, and Good Luck that was first delivered here in June of 1996. Uh, for those of you who left the room that day scratching your heads, um, as Jim Simons offered, his secret to success is simply luck. Um, hopefully our panelists today will not be so restrained. Uh, but before we begin today, I'd like to ask you, at the request of our programming committee, uh, to please um, offer your suggestions for future speakers and subjects. Um, uh, and that way, this can be a little bit more of a democratic process. And as a courtesy to our speakers, to please fill out the back sides of your invitation cards uh, so that we can do, try to do a better job. Uh, we've got two first-rate speakers today. We're both are accomplished practitioners and academics. Um, and at this point, I'd like to introduce them. Joining us again, Andrew Lowe is the director of MIT's Laboratory for Financial Engineering, a professor of finance at the Sloan School and the founder of Paloma's Alpha Simplex Group in Cambridge, Mass. Uh, Andrew is, a, is widely published and a tireless researcher. His research into the frontier of investing is ahead of the curve, uncovering insights into areas like financial visualization, market microstructure, and neurobiological models of individual risk preferences. Andrew Lowe, in the world of nerds, is a quantitative rock star. <laughs> There's a backhand. <laughs> uh, he's a recipient of the Sloan Foundation Fellowship, the Paul Samuelson Award, the Graham and Dodd Award, and the IFE Financial Engineer of the Year Award. He's a governor of the Boston Stock Exchange and a member of NASDAQ, or the NESD's Economic Advisory Board. Andrew earned his PhD from Harvard in 1984. Cliff Asnes is the founder of AQR Capital, a quantitative multi-strategy hedge fund and asset management company. AQR manages $5 billion across a series of investment products. Before AQR, Cliff headed the quantitative research group at Goldman Sachs Asset Management in New York. Cliff and his team built models to exploit anomalies in the stock, bond, and currency markets there. Before he was a trader and portfolio manager in Goldman's uh, mortgage back group, like Andrew, Cliff is widely published and terribly accomplished. He is a recipient also of the Graham and Dodd Award, is a visiting lecturer at Yale, Dartmouth, and MIT. It is also rumored that Cliff was a technical advisor on Revenge of the Nerds. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, if Andy's a, a nerd rock star, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm Andy's groupie. <laughs> Cliff earned his engineering degree from Penn and his MBA and PhD from the University of Chicago. Hunt Taylor is a moderator of the Greenwich Roundtable and manages the investment portfolio for the Stern family. So without any more noise from me, please welcome our special session and uh, uh, please welcome Hunt back as he sets the table. Good morning. Um, I was told a story recently about a gentleman who for his birthday received a uh, gift of a uh, fully grown parrot. Now, unfortunately, this uh, was a particularly um, ill-tempered parrot with a, uh, a very large vocabulary of uh, uh, rude and uh, uh, not just rude words, but uh, expletives, um, 
uh, and just a, a generally disagreeable beast entirely. Uh, but it was a sort of persistent guy. He spent many, many months trying to change the character of this, of this bird. He would, uh, you know, uh, change the environment of the room, put up soft lighting. He would spend hours teaching it polite words, play soft music to no effect. Um, he tried being aggressive with it. He tried, uh, uh, you know, reprimanding it when it would use foul language. He'd get frustrated and wrap it on the beak when it... Uh, and it's put all, all of none of this work. Uh, and finally, in a moment of desperation, just grabbed the, the, the bird by the wings and, and shoved it into the freezer. Well, it was about a minute and a half of, you know, loud squawking and kicking and screaming, followed by 30 seconds of absolute silence. And the guy became concerned on uh, thinking, my God, what have I done? Maybe I've killed this poor animal. So he opens the, uh, the freezer door, and this bird calmly steps out onto his extended arm and says, you know, I believe that my behavior over the last five or six weeks may have offended you. And I want to let you know that uh, um, starting right now, my behavior is going to change profoundly. And if anything that I've said over the last five or six weeks in any way has offended you, I'm truly sorry, sorry and I, I just deeply, deeply apologize. And I was just astounded. You couldn't figure out what could have happened in the last two minutes to have so profoundly affected this bird's behavior. He's about to ask him when the bird continues. He says, may I ask what the chicken did? <laughs> well, it's my contention that anyone who's been involved um, in the global equity markets over the last three years, one, um, has behaved like the parrot, and two, felt like the chicken. Um, and hopefully, what we um, what we will hope to accomplish here, at least in the next few minutes, um, is to gain some insight that will avoid uh, experiences um, that will make us behave like the parrot or feel like the chicken in the future. I am astounded in my day-to-day -day life with how many investment managers I encounter who in some way, shape, or form um, actually show kind of a lack of familiarity with some of the nuances of the mathematics of portfolio management. Let me just throw a quick question at the audience. Um, if I were to pose a hypothetical question to the audience, let's say we had a, a manager offering the following proposition. You could invest with a manager, um, but you had to have a two-year lockup, so you had to stay the, t the full two years. And the premise was this. In the first year, you could choose a rate of return. You had any rate of return you wanted, but in the second year, you would have a drawdown that was at exactly half the rate of return of the first year. Um, the question would be as follows. What rate of return would you choose for the first year, and what would be the largest two-year return you could earn? Would anybody know that offhand? <coughs> anybody have any guess as to what would be the rate of return they want to choose? Pardon me? Well, no. Um, pardon me? Yeah, you'd lose half, whatever the first year's return was, you'd lose half what the first year's return was the second year. Well, the actual answer is the most you could return in that scenario would be 12.5%. And, um, and in order to do that, you'd only want to make 50%. So in other words, if you made 50%, you'd be up 150, you'd lose 25% of that, you'd make 12.5%. If you'd made more than that, numbers would start to come down. If I reversed that and said, same deal, two-year lock, but you had to choose a loss the first year and you could make double the second year, guess what the most you could make was? 12.5%, right? And in that case, you'd only want to take 25% loss the first year, you'd proceed to make a 50% gain the second year, and you'd wind up with 12.5%. Now that's called Siegel's Paradox. But um, I'm amazed how many portfolio managers are unaware of Siegel's Paradox. And so I just do that as a way of sort of setting the stage uh, that people are often unaware of some of the nuance, the mathematical nuances um, of 
portfolio management. So with that, I'm going to open it. Andrew's going to begin. Cliff is going to follow. And then we're going to open it to uh, questions as we always do. Um, so with um, no further introduction, Andrew, the stage is yours. I'd like to start by thanking Steve uh, Hunt and the Greenwich Roundtable for inviting me back again. Uh, apparently, double jeopardy doesn't apply to this forum. Uh, as, um, as Steve mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm both a uh, professor at MIT as well as a, uh, a budding hedge fund manager. And uh, so the mathematics of investing is particularly near and dear to my heart. Uh, in fact, as many of you probably know, mathematics and finance have uh, had both uh, uh, long and illustrious uh, histories at MIT. And that's one of the reasons that uh, drew me to their faculty. But th there's definitely a pecking order in, in the two subjects. And to give you an illustration of that, I, I still remember that um, you know, my sister, who was a, uh, an undergraduate at MIT, when she was, uh, was there, I was, I think, in junior high school. And we used to go up and visit her uh, during a break and drop her off and pick her up. And uh, my, w when my sister was there, she uh, gave me a tour of the campus at MIT and said that, you know, MIT is a very rational, uh, very logical place. All the buildings are numbered, so that nobody refers to any of the buildings by name. They refer to them by number. And I asked my sister, well, is there any reason for these particular numbers? And she said, oh, yes, the numbers uh, have a very specific meaning. The, uh, the numbers are in reverse order to the importance of the discipline uh, in the buildings. So for example, building one at MIT houses the president and the main administration. <laughs> building two is the mathematics uh, department. Um, building six is the physics department, and so on. There's a pecking order. And I thought this was terribly rational and, and just wonderful. And so many years later, after I uh, got my degree and was offered a job at MIT, I was quite excited. I went to visit the campus at, at the Sloan School and um, you know, asked them, well, this is a, a, a wonderful opportunity. Can you tell me, uh, just out of curiosity, what is the uh, building number here? <laughs> they said, well, we're building E52. <laughs> so I was quite discouraged by that. Um, but I think, uh, I think most of you would agree that um, there's considerable intellectual merit in applying mathematics to financial markets. And there's a lot that we don't understand, but there's quite a bit that, that we do understand in making use of quantitative methods uh, in investing. Now, I, uh, I want to just that people use every day and uh, are becoming more and more <coughs> refined. So I think that's an example of mathematics uh, that's used appropriately and uh, really uh, has become indispensable to the industry. Let me turn now to uh, mathematics used inappropriately. A few years ago, I was contacted by a, a major pension plan sponsor. This is a, a, a sponsor of a, a pension plan of a Fortune 500 company. And uh, he called me up um, to uh, ask uh, whether or not I would be able to work on a consulting project having to do with asset allocation. And I said, uh, well, sure, I've done that before. Um, you know, what are you looking to accomplish? And uh, he said that we'd like to have you develop an asset allocation model for us uh, using neural networks. And I said, well, um, I, I, I do know something about that, but why in particular would you like to use neural networks? It was a rather strange request because this individual wasn't particularly familiar with uh, those set of tools. And he said, well, you know, we've heard that uh, uh, the asset allocation problem is a very difficult and challenging one, and we don't really have the staff to work on that. Um, and so what we'd like to do is to develop a, a system that essentially learns on its own so that, you know, you can develop it for us and then after a few years it'll get good at it and we don't need to worry about it anymore. <laughs> now, you laugh at that, but, I mean, this is an absolutely serious request and ultimately I decided... You know you're particularly cracking me up, right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you, you, the history of that request. Let, let's, uh, we yeah. probably shouldn't get into yes, that yes. at point. <laughs> Wasn't me. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's not what you're thinking, Cliff, so. Anyway, um, the, the, the point is that um, uh, that was an example, I think, of uh, a quantitative model that I think was um, misinterpreted and misinterpreted uh, on the part of the, of the, uh, the literature, frankly. I mean, there's an aura about neural networks at the time that suggested that it somehow learned uh, that on its own. It mimicked the uh, human cognitive processes. And, of course, it is true that the origins of mathematical models of, of neurons uh, did lead to certain advances in modeling these uh, objects quantitatively, uh, but they uh, certainly don't learn in the way that humans do, and it was uh, quite a, a misleading uh, kind of a, a, a product or, or a method. Since that time, I think there are many other black box systems that have come out of this literature, 
And I've done, on a number of occasions, due diligences for investors where we've had uh, a, a variety of mathematicians, physicists, computer scientists try to pass off these kinds of tools as being somehow mysterious and, uh, uh, and amazing when, in fact, they're, they're nothing more than uh, tools that uh, are, are designed to solve very specific problems. So um, in, in summary, what I thought I would do is just give you what I, what I have as sort of five rules of thumb about um, ma the application of mathematics to investing. And I'll leave you with these uh, thoughts uh, and then, um, and then uh, refer you to the papers that I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have afterwards. So the five rules of thumb I have uh, uh, really have to do with using various different kinds of tools uh, in, uh, in, in investing. The first being that no matter, uh, no matter how complex and subtle a strategy is, no matter how sophisticated it might be, um, it has to be possible to describe that strategy in relatively simple and intuitive terms to a sophisticated investor. In other words, uh, regardless of how uh, subtle and, and impressive and sophisticated the strategy is, I've never come across anything that couldn't be described in relatively straightforward terms uh, as to what the value added of that strategy was, whether it was risk transfer, superior information, better executions, mean reversion, and so on. So I think that's the first uh, principle that uh, I think is, is obvious to many investors, but to, to some who are not as familiar with quantitative methods, they may feel uh, that uh, they're just not really smart enough to understand, but I, I think that's just not the case. The second uh, rule of thumb is that you'll never see a bad back test. Uh, now, again, this may be obvious to the experienced investor, but there's a very specific set of quantitative models that you can use to be able to gauge the bias that comes about from selection. The fact is that uh, uh, when I've uh, talked with investors about doing due diligence, I've often said that, you know, whatever back test you'd like to see, uh, I can certainly produce for you. Uh, if you torture the data long enough, it will basically tell you anything you want. Um, the fact is, though, that this kind of selection bias uh, is something that you can take into account, and there are tools by which you can gauge the degree of, uh, of bias in a back test. The third principle is that any mathematical model should leverage human judgment, not replace it. Uh, it's not an either or, but really it's a combination. And to, to me, this is uh, most clearly is illustrated in uh, uh, what I've been working on recently, which is statistical arbitrage. Now, most of you, I think, are familiar with statistical arbitrage as you know, looking for small anomalies uh, in equity returns. And an example of this is uh, pairs trading, where you try to find relationships between pairs of securities. Well, instead of pairs, think about focusing on uh, groups of pairs. Let's say you have four different types. If you have a universe of using four at a time, you'd get something like 210 billion, 94 million, 780, 875 uh, combinations. And obviously, you can't search through all of these uh, systematically, so you require some kind of, of human judgment as to how you would construct the appropriate algorithm to be able to find anomalies. Moreover, when you're looking at four securities at a time, there's a lot of human judgment that comes into how you take advantage of these anomalies and whether the anomalies are real or purely uh, statistical. Uh, the fourth principle is that mathematical models are a lot like power tools. Uh, if you've ever had to put together a living room set from Ikea, you'll know that after an hour or two, a power drill with a hex drill bit will quickly become your best friend. Uh, on the other hand, you probably wouldn't want to give a chainsaw to your eight-year-old um, because uh, it's really not appropriate. And so any kind of a mathematical model re really requires a certain degree of sophistication that doesn't replace uh, human judgment, but, but really uh, has to work with it. And the last uh, rule of thumb is that despite the importance of mathematical modeling, or perhaps because of it, human preferences, I think, are the next big challenge in quantitative investing. That is, developing a mathematical model of human cognition, human behavior, human learning, uh, and the kind of cognitive biases that all of us uh, suffer from, that's something that I think is really <coughs> going to be an important component of quantitative investing. Because while we have a number of models that can tell us about probabilities and prices, we have virtually nothing to tell us anything about preferences. And to me, that's the, the next uh, undiscovered country. So in, in concluding, let me just say that every discipline uh, has its strengths and weaknesses, and that uh, it's just important to be aware of you know, how to use each of these disciplines properly. 
Uh, and uh, I, I was uh, uh, reminded of this fact recently when I was uh, at a, an MIT student-run dinner, and a bunch of graduate students were arguing about uh, the, which part of engineering or which kind of engineering was more important than the other. And uh, the, the argument finally reduced to uh, you know, a, a discussion of what kind of an engineer God was in designing the human body. And uh, you know, one of the students said, well, God must have been an electrical engineer because of all the electrical connections in our nerve cells. And then another student said that, well, God has to have been a mechanical engineer because of all of the joints and the muscles that uh, are in the human body. <laughs> and finally, one student in the back said, well, no, it's, it's obvious that God was a civil engineer. And everybody sort of scratched their head and said, well, how do you get that? And he said, well, only a civil engineer would have run a toxic waste pipeline through a recreational area. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But, uh, that, that, that joke is hard to follow. Yeah. Andrew, <laughs> um, Andrew, before you start, I want to, I mean, Cliff. Cliff, before you start, I, I, one thing you said struck me, I just want to ask you a question about it, and it has to do with your comments on um, uh, the validity of optimization against the, the, the um, threat of uh, black boxes. It kind of contradicts my experience um, in what I see when I look at managers. I've seen any number of managers who come to me with optimized systems, and they're never robust. Um, uh, and always the telltale sign is they always need to be re-optimized. They're optimized for a period of time. They work, they decay, and then you're re-optimizing. Meanwhile, some of the most successful um, and permanently hard-closed managers, D. E. Shaw, you know, um, Renaissance are running black box systems. Um, how do you respond to that? Well, I, actually, that's a yeah, that's a very good point, and let me let me talk a bit about that. Obviously, um, you know, folks like David Shaw and Jim Simons are the uh, uh, you know the the, the, the gold Don't standard. Say they're, box stars. <laughs> they're, they're the gold standard in this industry, um, and I, I mean, I, I obviously I shouldn't speak for them, but I have talked to both of them about their uh, approaches to investments, and I would I would say that if you were to ask them are they a black box trading system, I think they would be, they would be very offended by that. In other words, what, what they would say is they may be black box to you. Right. That is, they're not going to tell you what they well, do. Well, they're only talking about the color of the box. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the fact is that if you ask Jim Simons about how he does what he does, or you ask any of the research scientists that either G.E. Shaw or Renaissance employs, they can tell you fairly specifically why it is that they think their systems are adding value, how they're adding value, and what needs to change over time in order to continually improve their systems. Mm -hmm. That to me is not a black box system because it's pretty clear what's inside the box in the various different components despite the fact that they won't tell investors a lot of that. Um, what I, what I ref when I say black box systems, I'm referring to folks that, that can't really articulate themselves why the, the system works. They're using something like a neural network, and they train the system on data, run a thousand back tests, they pick the best one. That's a kind of optimization that isn't appropriate because what they're optimizing is, is noise rather than signal. And uh, so I think that, that that's the distinction. And I, what I about think. optimization, the fact that you always need to re-optimize? Well, I mean, I think that that's part of life in the sense that as uh, market conditions change and as uh, the investment processes change, one needs to adapt to it. So, you know, one could say optimization as soon as you make use of it. Mm -hmm. So that it, it, the only way of generating consistent returns is to constantly replenish the stock of ideas that you're exploiting. So you can't dip your foot in the same river twice. <laughs> That's a better way of putting it, yes. Okay. Cliff, you're up. Sure. L let me start with uh, three, three kind of unplanned observations just on what's, what's just been described. First, uh, we're going to need you guys to generate some heat here because I'm going to pretty much agree with Andy. Oh. Now, a, 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 a dirty little secret left out of Andrew's bio is that 15 years ago he made an error and wrote one of my recommendations to the PhD program at the University of Chicago, and I have not yet found a reason to really fight with him. Um, I heard the, I've heard this before. Um, I'm, I'm sure he means it in a much more sophisticated way, but Jim Simon's uh, observation that the secret to success is luck, I would amend that slightly to the secret to success is highly repetitive luck which is a little bit harder to achieve. And finally, I'm just reminded of one anecdote. Uh, Fisher Black, um, who many of, many of us knew, was a lovely, lovely guy, but 
I knew him at Goldman Sachs fa fairly well for a while. We worked on the same floor. And I was a young PhD student at Goldman for the summer at that point. So that was like nirvana to me. And one thing that struck me is we were in a meeting once where he was proposing a strategy with a terrible back test. And it had like 20 years of losing money. And it was why he liked the strategy. Because his philosophy was so many other people are just data miners that they have to be taking the other side of this thing by now, so it has to be good going forward. <laughs> and, I mean, Fisher, Fisher uh, suffered from groupthink less than anyone I've ever met, so he might be an extreme version of that. And, and I don't count it's going that far, but I thought I'd share it with you. It, work? <laughs> it, 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 works, it works distressingly often, that strategy. Um, no, we didn't actually track that one going forward. Uh, Andy and I are given a hard topic or an easy topic, depending on how you view it here, because it's so general. You know, the title is the, the Mathematics of Investing. Uh, I'm going to define I'm going to define it and 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 I'm going to address my comments along along two paths, but there are lots of ways you can go with this. One is I'm just going to take you through my four or five favorite observations about finance that that you need some math to get to. Uh, there there are a lot about asset allocation and long run returns, and they're they're not particularly geeky, uh, but I think they're places where math has had where without math you couldn't have couldn't have done it, and it's had an interesting impact. And then I'm maybe gonna gonna start a little, little of a little of a tougher discussion, um, from a defensive standpoint. I'm a guy with quantitative in his title. Uh, applied quantitative research is what the AQR stands for in our firm. So I'm going to start talking about uh, the, the the quantitative uh, controversy, fighting about quantitative management. I'm going to talk about what some of the knocks on it are and what some of my responses are. And Andy already touched on some of these, and and maybe we'll start a a, a dialogue or even if, even a friendly debate on those. Um, starting a few general observations on, on, on finance and, and math and how it's used. Uh, my first and maybe the most important one is, is I was at a, a similar, though I, I'll say I'll suck up a bit, less auspicious gathering a, a, a month or two ago, and the statement was made to me, isn't the last few years, the, the, la the, the bubble up, the bubble down, uh, a real death blow to modern portfolio theory? Uh, which I had to scratch, you know, sometimes, you, you know, when you get direct questions, it's easy to answer, it's, it's yes, you know, it's not easy to be right, but it's easy to answer. Uh, this was much more general. I had to scratch my head for a minute uh, and say, uh, well, well, is it? Well, I think it, it was a serious blow to the idea that markets are perfectly efficient. I'm an ex-PhD student of, uh, of Gene Fama's at Chicago for a bunch of years and an ex-teaching assistant of his, so this is, this pains me to say so running a hedge fund day to day, it does not pain me to say, uh, but it probably was a, a real blow to that. It was probably maybe not a mortal blow, but it was certainly a, a nice broadside to the. I, I, I was not as fast on my, seat, um, on my feet there. I mumbled for about even longer than this during my answer at this talk, but I came up with this answer that it was a startling affirmation of modern portfolio theory. The guy following modern portfolio theory starting in 1998 owned some of everything, right? He owned a lot of bonds. He owned a lot of small cap stocks, a lot of value stocks. He probably noticed that there was a bubble that came up and down, uh, but he noticed it a lot less than many of the rest of us because he was listening to it. So number one, like one of the biggest things I think math has, has brought to finance has, has worked like a charm. My favorite chart ever, uh, it's a series of five charts that I refuse to use because I'm stealing it from someone from years ago, uh, but I will tell you about it is um, somebody did five efficient frontiers over five different five-year periods, and everyone was screwed up. Everyone had the wrong assets at the top, bonds beat stocks, you know, stocks beat one by too much, international was negative. All, well, he put them all together for 25 years, and it, it worked like a charm, and it looked a little bit like magic. So I'll start saying there's one where mathematical finance, I think, I think really helps. Moving on to number two, uh, stocks for the long run. You know, I love to talk about this when people sometimes say, you know, does this fit the topic? One thing I love to say about the argument of stocks for the long run, if, you, uh, if you're a long-run investor, you'll, you'll eventually or always win in stocks over long horizons, and you should have a lot of your portfolio in them. That's all. I'll sum that up. The first thing I note about it is it's a quantitative model. It's got a back test. It's got a back test that nobody really literally followed perfectly. It's recommending that if you had done this certain thing that nobody really did, things would have been really good, right? It's not usually put that way. 
It's a back test with some flaws. Now, this is more controversial. This is more in the area of opinion, which we, we can argue about. Uh, but it's got some flaws, right? It looks at a period where stocks averaged a P of 14 and reached its most prevalent prominence, uh, prominence when stocks had a P of 35 to 40. It looks at one country largely. It looks at the country that won the century. So it's a back test with, 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 with flaws. Finally, my favorite, and this is where math gets a little cute on this one. A lot of us have come to the view um, in the last couple of years that with prices, where, and, and I have this view, with prices where they are today, we no longer have an insanely priced stock market, uh, but we have a stock market price to more, more reasonable returns going forward than we're used to through history. You know, seven, eight percent kind of numbers, a few percent over bonds, uh, a few percent over inflation, not the giant gaps that we used to have. But the, the refrain often goes, but that's okay, because I win over the long run in stocks. So two, three percent, four percent over bonds, that's, that's fine because I win over the long run. It's not as good as it used to be, but it's fine. An interesting mathematical consequence of that argument is you don't necessarily win over the long run. People have very much confused average return with risk. If you look for the last hundred years, stocks have beat bonds by five percent, inflation by seven percent, something like that. That could be off by a few. I hate when I get numbers wrong because Quan is in my title. It's very embarrassing. Um, if you if you just you can't do this linearly because you have compounding, but if you go stocks beat inflation by seven percent, that means over 20 years you get a 140 percent cushion. Again, I'm playing fast and loose with math. Stocks have a 20 percent volatility. You take the square root of 20 times that, you get a, a you know 80 90 percent volatility over 20 years. You got a one and a half. You need a one and a half standard deviation event over 20 years for stocks to lose. And we only get to observe about four 20-year periods. It's not so surprising they've never lost. Cut all those risk premium in half, and then every once in a while you're going to get a bad draw and stock's going to lose for 20 years. Comes out, if you cut it in half, it comes out to, and you do a simulation study, they lose about a quarter of the time. So we don't just lose the average return, we lose the certainty. My favorite kind of down-home analogy to this is if if you tell me one football team beats another 35 to 31, it's not so shocking to then follow saying, and by the way, they also won every quarter. If you tell me 31 to 3, it is not shocking they didn't lose any quarter. If one football team beats another one 35 to 24, suddenly you probably assume the other team maybe won one or two of the quarters. So when we look forward with stock prices where they are today, if you buy into this, and it's arguable, I don't think it's so arguable, I'm being nice, uh, but if you buy into it, Stocks have a lower mean return going forward and a chance of losing, which is entirely appropriate, right? Anything that has no risk over the appropriate time horizon, everyone should pour into. It should be arbitraged away. The flaw, the fatal flaw of the Dow 36,000 argument is it was the ultimate example of confusing these two things. It said stocks have never lost over the, over the long term. Therefore, they can be priced to a much lower expected return. Unfortunately, if they're priced to a much lower, even equal to bonds expect to return, they will lose half the time going forward. And suddenly people will say, hey, you know, I really need a risk premium on these things. So that's number two, uh, a mathematical observation. Number three is very related. Um, it's about um, if you are a long-term investor who loves risk or can tolerate risk. Let me, let me put it that way. Should you be 100% invested in equities? This is something I've been, I've been yelling about for about 10 years. Commonly, you see people say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm young, I'm, I'm risk tolerant, uh, the, the proper asset for me is 100% equities. But what, what does theory tell us it should be? Remember, the, you lever that portfolio. Well, here's another back test, and it is a back test. But if you do that exercise for the last 75 years, don't invest 100% in stocks. Invest in stocks and bonds. On a rolling basis, figure out what your risk is, and then lever that up to the risk of just stocks. You've done a fair amount better. Even more so, and this is something you've got to look at with leverage, you've done a fair amount better with highly similar worst cases. So there's another case where it's 75 years and the next year could prove that horribly wrong, but there's another case where theory and math kind of win over some conventional wisdom. My next one is Bill Miller. Uh, I've got, I got to update this one uh, because Bill, Bill's starting to kick my butt on this one, I've got to tell you. Because about two, three years ago, when they started talking about his streak, I went back and I, I went to, I forget which date, but I went to the beginning of the streak and I went to Mark Carhart's paper on mutual funds and I found out how many, how many reasonable sized mutual funds were outstanding at the beginning. 
And I said, let's say every, and this might be being a little too kind to them, but I said, let's say every mutual fund manager has a 50% chance of winning in any year. How many Bill Millers should we see? And the answer was really very damning to the industry because it was like 15. So I used to like to walk around pointing out saying the question is not, you know, uh, uh, about how shocking Bill Miller is. The embarrassing question is how come we don't have more of him, given how many start. Now, I'm amending that because we're getting down to the one to two expected, considering he keeps doing it, which is really annoying. It's like when I started making fun of the Super Bowl effect about 10 years ago, and it worked for about the next eight years. That, that's annoying. But having said that, it is interesting. Um, many of us have been in this position. Um, I've been on the other side, too. I've been in, in the good and the bad side of this, of having results maybe better than, than, than you might expect. And I will tell you, and this is not a statement about, about Bill, because skill can exist also. It doesn't mean it's luck. But if you are the monkey who types Hamlet, it is very hard to be introspective about that and go, perhaps I have hit all these keys randomly one billion times. That doesn't really happen. It's harder. And finally, my last, my last kind of general mathematical observation, and I'll just say a couple of defensive words about quantitative investing, is how many of us have seen the argument, you know, you don't want to try to time the stock market because if you're out, and they're all different versions, for the 10, 20, worse, days or months, you give back all the return. We've all probably seen that. Generally came to major prominence in 99 and 2000 when it was a don't sell argument. Because uh, you can't time it, don't sell. You know, of course, this is rather simple, and a lot of you probably figure out where I'm going with this. But if you flip that argument, do the exact opposite, miss the 10 or 20 worst times, it is staggeringly symmetrical. It was more symmetrical than I would have thought it would be, because I thought stock returns are, have a big left tail. Uh, so I thought it might actually come out better, but it was just staggeringly symmetrical. Um, that is not an argument to time the market. It is a statement that the typical observation you see about not timing the market can be summed up as this. If you do a radically ridiculous market timing strategy, which is 20 times in 70 years, run 100% out of your stocks into cash, hold that for one day or one month and then run back, and you get it exactly pathologically wrong, that would be bad. That is the only thing that says. The opposite is equally and is obviously true. And you're then faced with a very difficult timing. You know, it's not a commercial for timing the market. It's obviously a very hard thing to do. And you face transactions and tax costs from doing it. So it's not a commercial to do it. It's just an example where some of the things you see in, in ads or, or write-ups all the time can use math in a bad way. Now let me say just a, a couple of, of things about quantitative portfolio management. And again, I'm a, I, you know, one of the things the last five years has taught us is biases are okay, but you should declare them up front. I'm obviously a quant manager, so, so some, somebody out there yell at me. Does anyone, you know, I'll start out being a little more cynical, though. Does anyone uh, remember an old movie, Colossus, The Forbin Project? That's where the United States and, U, and, and the USSR, remember the USSR? Um, both build major, major computers with all kinds of artificial intelligence algorithms to run their defenses. And of course you know it, it's a 1950s version of the Terminator. Uh, they start talking to each other, blah, 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 and you know, everything ends. I think that is, that I use that because that, that is the, the dark side of quantitative management. That's the image in, in people's heads, whether they've seen the movie or not. You don't need to see the movie. Uh, let, me, let me get a little bit more specific. What, what are four big knocks on quantitative management? Well, one, it, it, it's Andy's. Uh, it's uh, not Andy's knock, but one he mentioned. Uh, it's like driving with the rear view mirror. Uh, I put it a little different. I loved Andy's observation. I put it a little different that non-quantitative management is for some reason choosing to drive without a rear view mirror. Uh, but th that's clearly one big knock. Second knock is it eventually blows up or eventually stops working. You, know, you hear that, uh, quant, you know, eventually stops. Uh, number three, uh, again, I'm going to spend a second on this because Andy already did very well, is it's a black box. And number four is very big, and it's very appropriate to be in Greenwich for this, because there is a very vague, very general LTCM-ish concept. A lot of people have that in their heads, right? You know, so that's, that's, that's amorphous. It's about, uh, it's about leverage and liquidity and quantitative models all tied into one. So four, four knocks on quantitative management. Now let me do some epic whining. I never thought I'd be on the side of political correctness here. But I am a believer that there's something called quantism out there. It's a geek, it's a, it's a form of anti-geek racism. <laughs> when, so quants are a race. 
They're a, a race, a creed, a color, united by an inability to dance. <laughs> and plastic pencil for guests. So, suppose, suppose something. I appreciate the laughter, but you guys got to stop. <laughs> how many, how many judgmental things have blown up? How many things where, where it was some guy's opinion? You'd never hear people say, "Yeah, I was with that guy who was using his, his judgment to run the money, and he blew up." I'm not using judgment anymore. <laughs> there, you know, wh wh the premise is he wasn't using judgment to begin with. Yeah, well, that's that's true, and that can apply to anyone. Um, but with, with all those, I, you know, one, one thing, and, and being serious for a second, a necessary condition for most forms of prejudice is that the group being prejudiced against is identifiable, is that they share some common characteristics that it sticks to. And I do think there's something to that. When you hear a quant blew up or had a tough time or isn't doing well, it goes into the little mental column of you know, bad news for quants. When you hear the, uh, uh, about anything else, you don't, you just don't do it to the same extent. And I could be wrong, and I could be very defensive about that, and I'd love to, to hear opinions, and it doesn't prove quant is good. The second part of this, though, is there is also a bit of a Luddite streak to all of us, right? How many of us were rooting for the computer against Kasparov? How many of us think that, that what we want is the high school nerds and a bunch of Russian physicists to make all the money? You know, having a negative opinion on quant is virtually a vote in favor of humanity. And... All right, I'm done whining. I'm not going to be pushing for a federal law protecting quants. Um, let me address my, my final comments. Let me address the four specifics I mentioned before. Let me, let me just quickly tick through those and then, and then really finish with some of, some of the, the true negatives I think about quants, sim some similar to Andy. One, about the rearview mirror. It, it's almost too obvious to say, but driving, assuming the past perfectly replicates is obviously a bad characteristic of quantitative managers and it's a bad characteristic of active managers or more judgmental managers. It's one both are guilty of the, at the end of 2000 or the end of 99, someone assuming tech stocks would continue to go up was doing the same thing. Um, no, nobody, uh, no quant would say you can just do that. Judgment, you actually, it's funny, it's, it's a little subtlety. You, it's very hard to build a model without judgment. You know, we're all probably familiar with the earnings revision strategy. Buy stocks when earnings revisions are positive, sell when they're negative. It was a money machine back in the 1980s. Still been okay over the last five years, but its sharp ratio looks like this. It just comes, the rolling sharp ratio just comes down. So let's even say you're an optimizer. Do you, what do you put in for its mean? Do you use its last three-year average, five-year average, 10-year average, or 20-year average? I'm not even saying what the answer is, but you can't run from judgment. It's there every time. The, the second is, 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 does it eventually stop working? And the answer to that is just yes, and here I'm just echoing what Andy said. But it's not specific to quantitative management. It is hard to get anything that works. Markets might not be perfectly efficient, but they're not that far. And anything you find that works, a lot of smart people are trying to do also. So I think, I, I think it, is a, it is a fair comment, and, and any time you're talking to a specific manager, where you are in the life cycle of that, it's very fair to talk about. But to apply it specifically to quant is, is a little strange. You know, black box. Black box, I'll, I'll just spend a second on because Andy did it. Um, I think Andy's distinction, and Hunt's very good question, and Andy's, Andy's great answer was exactly right. A, two questions. One is, do you tell your clients about your models? And every manager, you know, we happen to be fairly open about this. Um, that could be a statement on how easy we think our models are to steal. It doesn't mean we're altruistic. But the question is, is it a black box to the manager? I'll tell you, we, ha we had one bad year in my life and that was 1999. And the way we kept most of our clients was we opened up, we took them in and we said, here's how we go from, from raw data to deciding what to long and deciding what to short. We know it is not working now. Here's exactly the process. Would you do this or not? And you know, I'm thankful that we got a very positive answer, but we had the ability to do that. I think there are, I think they're rare. I think they're a little bit the unicorn out there, but there are probably models out there where people have no ability to do that, and I think I would share Andy's skepticism about those, but I think that's probably the exception, at least for good management, not the, not the rule. Now finally, LTCM. I feel bad doing this because it's too ex post. Uh, it's very easy to see very smart people make some bad decisions and years later say what you would have done, because you don't know. But I get my back up when they're referred to a little bit as a, as, a, as a quant shop. They were 
and, and as Andy said, this is not a bad strategy long term. They were liquidity and, and, and risk providers to the world. Their portfolio was shockingly similar to the portfolios of Goldman Sachs and Bear Stearns and every other trading desk on Wall Street, none of which were ever referred to as quants. So I personally, you know, there are issues there. We all learned a lot from that, and it's easy to stand on other people's shoulders and learn, so it's not a criticism. But I get a little defensive, and it's another thing we can fight about, about, about whether that should be something that sticks to quant as, as a rule. Now, finally, let me, let me leave you with, with who I think, and, and this will be my anti-quant statement. The, um, the most dangerous person in the world is. The most dangerous person in the world is a young quant, uh, often straight off the physics farm. The most, a more dangerous person than that person is that person if they've had a good year or two. These are dangerous. There are a lot of lessons they have yet to learn. They have yet to learn that things are not normally distributed. And they have yet to learn that the answer to that is not to go assume something is an elli a more general elliptical distribution. There are other answers to that. They've yet to learn that transactions costs are two times what you assume and five times what you assume if you have to get out. One of my favorite stories, we were at Goldman Sachs, we were building, uh, literally this is 1993, and building a first version of what became a currency trading strategy for us. And we went to the currency traders, and we said, what transactions cost should we assume in our model? And they said zero. Currencies are very cheap to trade. And we said, well, let's use a working assumption of zero. Oh, we appear to have a four sharp ratio if we assume zero. Turned out it was interesting. If, you, if all you do is punt on the end, then relative to the volatility you take, zero is, is, is perilously close to an accurate number. It's not zero, uh, but it doesn't matter that much. If what you do is any kind of spread trading in currencies, if what you do is, is long the euro and short the Swiss franc, the world has not gotten to a point, maybe it should, but it has not gotten to the point where transactions costs are in volatility space. They're in dollar space very often. And suddenly transactions costs matter a lot. So we didn't, we didn't lose a lot of money on that one, but that was an interesting one to learn. Um, another thing the, this, this physicist has yet to learn is that a strategy he's been sitting on that has a sharp ratio of three for, th for four years. That, that's pretty wonderful. You get a T-stat, you get a square root of four or two, you get a T-stat of six. There is still a very decent chance he will have a negative three sharp ratio the next year. That is only a chance. What is certain is he's betting a ton more at the end of the three years than he was at the beginning, and the round trip can be ugly. So what else have I learned? Uh, leverage isn't bad, liquidity isn't bad, you put the illiquidity is not bad, you put the two together, you, you, you have an atom bomb. That's a lesson that's not learned. Uh, uncorrelated, Andy alluded to this, is a very dangerous word. That's something I've learned the hard way. Not too hard, thank God, but I've certainly learned it the hard way. Um, I, I'm a fan of thinking more complicated mathematics does not necessarily make a better model. It can, but it doesn't necessarily make one. And finally, this is not unique to, to quantitative management. It's, it's to anything. The first one to three months that you do anything will be disastrous. That's something people should all learn. Um, I think if that physicist guy is smart and savvy and, and wants to learn and learns these lessons and survive, there's no, way to, there's no way I can teach this, by the way. It's interesting. It's like trying to teach your kids. Trying to teach your kids your own mistakes. And, they, and right, I, I, have, I don't have kids, but I got two on the way in April. I get, come on, I get an awe. <laughs> and you're, I learned this... You're about to get a lesson in chaos. There. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. Um, but you can't, right? If someone read these to me seven years ago, I'm like, yeah, old man. Right, that's going to be a problem. Someone who learns those lessons, I think, becomes valuable. I think someone before learning those lessons is exceptionally, exceptionally dangerous. All right, a, a couple of quick comments and a question, then we're going to open it up to the audience. Uh, one... I just have to throw this comment in because I love it so much. I don't particularly direct it to you, but given I've loved your bullet points on mathematics, but given some of the stock stuff, which I agree with, there's a comment I used to love, and it said, most people use statistics the way drunks use a lamppost, which is for support rather than illumination. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's uh, similar to Andy's. You can make him say anything you want, yeah, but, but yeah. funnier. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, too, you know, when people are talking about stocks for the long run, you can't help but think about 1966, where you went 17 years and the Dow gained one point, and in the course of that, if you put a dollar into the Dow, you, you, per you were able to purchase 12 cents worth of goods, 
after the impact of inflation over those 17 years, and it was actually 1993 before you got your dollars worth of purchasing power back. So it was very important that you didn't die or go broke or need the money at any time in those 25 years. So um, you're really talking about stocks for the long run when you get into that argument. The other one, it sounds like you're a fan of Nassim Taleb's fooled by randomness um, when you're looking at the outperformance of a number of long-only managers over time, Bill Miller in particular. But here's a question I want to ask you. Um, we're talking about... Um, um, you're being, having been a teaching assistant for Eugene Fama, and it sounds like you're something of a fan. You're closer to an efficient market theorist than a be behavioral finance guy. And if that were true, I mean, you went so far as to say that markets aren't perfectly efficient, but they're pretty close. So what's your rationale for um, NASDAQ 5000? you know, a year later, NASDAQ sure. 1200. Sure. How's an efficient market theorist explain that? Um, you're putting me in a strange position here because uh, I'm a guy who was shorted from 3,000 to 5,000 and wrote ranting screeds about why it was insane. Okay. So to argue that it was That's efficient, job, by the way. To, to, to argue well, that it's efficient it now is... is <laughs> the, um, a few things. I am a fan of, of Nassim's basic argument, uh, which really can just boil down to the PG version that stuff happens. Um, the big event is, is out there, and, and, and you have a lot of vignettes about it and a lot of talk about it, but I, I am a fan of, of at least acknowledging and worrying about that. Mm -hmm. Efficient markets, um, I think, I, I actually would, would recharacterize that. I think I am more of a behaviorist. I am a bit of a heretic from Chicago. This goes back, to actually, to my Chicago day. I actually wrote my dissertation for Gene on price momentum strategies and the fact that they worked. If I wrote it as they, they didn't work, that would have been a very Chicago-esque dissertation. And to his credit, we paint him uh, as too much of an extreme guy so much. The evidence was there and he was, he was, he was fine with it. He was not a guy to suppress something like that. Um, I am, you know, there's a line though. Calling a market inefficient uh, makes it sound like it's, it's easy to beat. And, and there are two kinds of inefficiencies in anywhere on the spectrum, right? I think the market is very inefficient in very small ways in a lot of places. And one thing I did not get to, I think quantitative techniques are particularly useful for to, to, to fix those, or to exploit those, or to fix those if you're being a positive or negativist on, on the societal outlook. Um, the other kind, the massive inefficiencies, do occur. They're rarer. They are far more certain if you have a long time horizon, and disastrously difficult to exploit and make money from. How many of us, how many of us thought stocks were overvalued and they're in the peak of the bubble? I mean, I would say most people in this room thought that. How many of us feel we made money from the round trip in the bubble? It's a very, very difficult thing to do. When markets get, you, you, I look back on that and I go, you know, I think we, we might have broke even, made a little money. It was, we exploit mispricings and it was the greatest mispricing I will ever see in my entire life. What happens to that? Things that are, you know, in this, let me tell one more anecdote. This, and I'm bringing my wife into this. This is late 1999. I am not the calm, happy man you see before you. <laughs> I am going home and basically ranting about my low opinion of my fellow man and how stupid people are for, for these prices. Um, my wife says, you know, and, and my wife I think is a very bright lady, but she's not a quant. So she's putting this in, in very simple words. She goes, you, you've described this to me before as what you do is you you exploit the fact that people don't price things perfectly right, right? And I'm like, yeah, I think I see where you're going with this. <laughs> and she says, so, but what you're saying is now you're unhappy that they're, they're too wrong. I'm like, yeah. She says, so what you want is them to be wrong in some calm, small way so you can just systematically take the fool's money. But if they're too foolish, you get annoyed with them. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I really hate that you put it that way, but yes. <laughs> Um, so I do think there are, the short answer, which I never give, is that I, I, I'm not a pure efficient market. I've, I've moved well off that. I don't think it's easy. Yeah. You, can, you can move to, if you, if you have a working definition of an inefficient market as it's one that's easy to make money from with low risk, then I'm an efficient markets guy. If you say, do prices perfectly reflect all information, I'm a very inefficient markets guy. Okay. Let's take some questions.
Sure. Well, um, I guess uh, the, the sort of the best way to uh, summarize my views on that is by um, a, a paper that I wrote a while ago, uh, which I think I've brought copies of, called the, the Three P's of Total Risk Management. Um, and I, I, I guess I could have equally well called it the Three P's of uh, Total Investment Management. The basic idea is that any kind of a systematic investment management program is going to involve three P's. And the three P's are prices, probabilities, and preferences. In order to construct a portfolio that matches a particular investor's needs, you need to have those three ingredients. And I think quantitative finance has been extraordinarily good at dealing with prices and probabilities. We've got lots of really interesting statistical models, lots of pricing models, but what's always left out of the equation is the third P, preferences. And I think Kahneman, Tversky, Thaler, and others have pointed out um, uh, in a very uh, helpful way that you can't leave that out because there's lots of aspects of preferences that we really need to take into account in constructing our investment policies. So I think that um, you know, my view is that it's not behavioral versus uh, rational finance, but rather uh, it's all the same. Finance is finance, and one aspect of finance happens to be human participants that engage in investment processes. So what I've been doing in my research, um, and also as well on the business side, is to try to take, it, take into account how preferences interact with the other two Ps. And I think that there are ways of doing that. And there are mathematical models that allow you to, to model the cognitive process, things like overconfidence, overreaction, underreaction, mean reversion, momentum, all of these phenomena that I think traders intuitively understand, they can actually model from both the psychological and the, and the physiological perspectives. During the bubble, the fact that payout ratios are very low was, was put out as a positive. It was, we're keeping the money because we have great things to reinvest in and whatnot. Um, and Rob and I went out to say, well, how does that hold up long term? And it turns out that if you divide up the world, and this is like one of my favorite scatter plots I've ever done. It's 120 years. It uses overlapping data, but you have 120 years of that, so it's, it's pretty decent. Um, on the x-axis, you put the payout ratio. On the y-axis, you put the next 10 years growth in earnings. Gr earnings grow much, much stronger when firms started out the 10 years paying out a lot of the money to investors, not retaining it. When they retained it, they grew very slowly. And the paper then does all, as you were referring to the technical things, is it just mean reversion and earnings and blah, blah, blah. We, we basically found dividends really matter. And our interpretation, I've got to be very careful, the empire building, we were careful in the paper to say we are guessing as to why this occurs. One chance is random noise, always is. It's a pretty strong result, but it could be random noise. Our, our guess, and, and kind of maybe fit in the zeitgeist of the last few years, was when firms retain a lot of the cash, it is a simultaneous time that they're building up empires. They're doing some imprudent things. When they're paying it out, um, there is a spirit of frugality. And if, the, if that same firm wants to take on a project, they absolutely can. They just have to go to the capital market and ask for more money. So there's a disciplining process to it. And I, but I want to be clear, we can't prove any of those. Those are our guesses as to why this is happening. Now, going forward, um, you know, the, whether firms change their policies, and we're doing work now and we're looking at too, because there are more share buybacks now than they used to, and you want to include that still doesn't get you to a very high payout ratio, especially if you adjust for options issuance. Uh, but that's one uh, potentially more optimistic thing now. Uh, but firms are only going to change their behavior if investors continue to care. And you hit the nail on the head. If we go back to an environment where investors don't care and, and rush into you know, story stocks for the future, then you're not going to get a lot of firms raising their dividends. If you go to an environment where investors, through what they will pay for stocks, start to assert, we want to see dividends, then it will matter. I mean, it, dividends are a hard one because when you, when you study them in any kind of academic setting, you have to laugh a little bit because they should be completely irrelevant. Right? If they keep the cash or give it to me, you almost are thrown into the behavioral world. Ex-tax issues, you're thrown into the behavioral world of what does it mean. And we find over time when the market as a whole is more disciplined, pays out the cash, and has a has a lodestone they have to follow, the world's a better place going forward. Uh, but I'm going to largely dodge your question about whether it's going to turn out good or bad, because I don't know. And if, they, if, you know, if, if, if firms keep constant, reasonable payout ratios, those are, those are transformations of each other. They're the same yeah. ratio. It's only when they really lower them. Um, so yeah, I would like to see that, only because I believe the historical evidence that it's been a, a good disciplining process. Uh, while being intellectually meaningless, it has worked well. Uh, a question for Andrew. Uh, in your academic writing, you criticize the current two-step approach uh, used in connection with linear-based models for predicting returns. And you offer alternative ideas for 
gravity or say MPP approach. I wonder, in fact, as a practitioner, whether you have encountered any problems um, in implementing the MPP approach. And if you're not using the MPP, why not? As a side for pre, I understand that basically in your long short portfolio, your linear based model, that what kind of response you have to um, to a uh, end Uh, so, so I guess I guess I should go okay. first. And remind uh, and remind me what the criticism was, so I can answer the second okay, part of the sure. question. <laughs> I'll make it easy for you. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you for actually reading that paper. I think uh, you're <laughs> probably the you know the, the eighth person that has read it. Uh, so, uh, just a, as a as a summary, let me first describe what the paper says. So this is a paper that I wrote with Craig McKinley uh, a few years ago that suggests that in predicting returns, very often what uh, a financial economist will do is they'll come up with a contemporaneous uh, linear factor model, uh, and then they'll try to predict the factors. And that's a sort of a two-stage process for prediction, instead of just simply using uh, predictors to try to predict the, uh, the, the future. Um, and so I, I guess um, to answer your question, um, Certainly, in, in what we're doing in, in our long short portfolio, we actually do use this one step as opposed to a two step method. And the main reason we do that is really for efficiency gains. Because even though you, you can have a great contemporaneous model that says that returns are a function of contemporaneous book to market, if book to market isn't predictable, then it's not useful from the perspective of making money or for, for generating alpha. Um, but I think that. Uh, you know, there are some important caveats to keep in mind. One is that um, linear models in general, I think, have been pretty well mined. And so getting back to the question that, uh, that Hunt raised, um, you can't continue to use a model over and over again. You need to constantly innovate. So actually, the kind of models that we're using are nonlinear models. The hazard with nonlinear models is that they are easily overfitted, and you need to have quite a bit more discipline to try to interpret where the value is coming from, because nonlinear is pretty much everything that's not linear. Uh, so there's quite a bit more uh, possibilities for uh, finding incorrect, uh, uh, spurious results. Um, but in any case, the, the, the point of the MPP was really that uh, in order to, to do forecasting, you ought to do forecasting as opposed to in have some kind of an intermediate step uh, in the middle. Yeah, I, I would just say, uh, I, I don't want to talk too much about what we do specifically, but um, I think we agree with that. I, I, I have been a, a, a big proponent, and it's exactly what Andy's saying more eloquently, that models stink in general. Models are low R-squared things. And when you link two of them, um, you often get gibberish. If I can predict something with a 10% R-squared and something else with a 10% R-squared, and I'm betting on the, 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 the latter thing because I need the first one to happen and I need the second one to happen, that's very bad. We, we, we try to be very simple in what we do. We have a few things that we think are related to returns that we do sorts on, we're not causing factors, and we're not doing regression forecasts of those. So we try to keep it very simple. Um, we try to avoid overfitting by making sure that same thing works in about 20 different places across different strategies. Uh, but I really, without getting too much into it, I, I, I don't think we're, we're disagreeing on this at all. I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a proselytizer also for the idea that trying to predict compound, pre trying to compound your predictions is very, very dangerous. There's one in the back. I, I would say a few things. There is no, you, you, you're a quant fascist if you say you're not allowed to do anything without a back test, right? Um, that, that cannot be the, the truth. In fact, that might be some of the places you get rewarded the most. As soon as we think we figure everything out, some, a lot of the risk, pre, risk premium almost pricing might, might have gone away. What I say to that is the framework can still be very useful. If the quantitative framework is what expected return do, do I need on this? Uh, given what correlations I am guessing at, it has. Th therefore, how much of my portfolio should I, should I have? That kind of thing, if the framework only forces you to answer those questions, if at the end of the day you look and you go, well, I didn't really realize once I wrote it down, this is a, a great return in this asset class, but it's 0.8 correlated with equities. Uh, so if I really believe that, my optimizer would tell me to have 1% of it. That's less exciting. So what I would say there is there is, you know, 
quantity, when, I, when both Andy and I are fans of putting judgment in these things, and all this says is you got all judgment and no data. You know, if you're a quant, you're all hat, no cattle, but, that, but, but in this case, you're not. You're allowed to do that. And that doesn't make it bad, but the framework saying, how does this correlate to everything else I do? Am I writing options or am I buying options? What kind of left tail do I have? What kind of right tail? What kind of sharp ratio do I think it has? That helps you lead to, that helps lead to intelligent decisions. But if it precludes you from doing something new, that's just dumb. Well, let me also follow up with an example. I mean, if you think about uh, something like um, uh, weather derivatives or uh, energy derivatives, uh, when those securities started trading, there really wasn't any kind of historical record of how to price those things. But because we have the mathematical framework of option pricing, it was actually relatively straightforward to figure out how to calibrate the initial models. So while I agree with you that um, you know, having historical data um, is uh, you know, certainly useful when you, when you have it. If you don't have it, the quantitative uh, framework is really uh, uh, helpful in that respect. If, if I'll take your question a moment. I, I've got one question I'd like to jump in with, and this is really something that I've kind of been kicking around personally in looking at various <coughs> managers over the years, and maybe you have opinions on it, maybe you don't. Um, an observation that's occurred to me is that different asset classes seem to attract different modeling techniques. So for instance, securities seem to attract reversion to the mean techniques by and large, whereas hard assets seem to attract trend following techniques. Do you agree? And if so, why do you think that is? Well, th I'm, I'm going to try to answer without being too self-serving because I have a strong opinion on this. <laughs> I think it's- Why does that not surprise me? It the self-serving or the strong? Don't strong answer opinion. both. <laughs> the this is strong opinion. I happen to think you're exactly right, and, and, I, and I do have a view, and this is just my view, that the world is, is wrong to do that. I think if you look at hard assets, trend-following strategies work better, mm -hmm. but mean reversion does work at a lower sharp ratio and is negatively correlated with, with trend-following strategies. And having been on the floor, and, the and richest yeah. guys were the spread traders. And, and the combination works better. I think one thing the quantitative framework, it, it hurts you sometimes, but one thing it brings you mm -hmm. is an appreciation for having, for not looking for the best strategy, but looking for the best combination of strategies. Mm -hmm. So if you have two strategies, one that is a one sharp ratio and one that is a 0.3 sharp ratio, but they're minus 0.6 correlated with each other. Mm -hmm. An intuitive person just doing this has a much stronger tendency to gravitate towards the one that's worked best and not think of the whole. Mm -hmm. But I think both work for both. You know, I think of some of the things we do, and this is why I said I didn't want to talk too much, as bringing contrarian work to places that people do trend following and blending it in and doing the opposite, uh, bringing trend following into some of the places where people do more contrarian. And finally, I'll say one advantage of quantitative management, I think, over, over more, qual I don't even know what the opposite of quantitative management is, qualitative, judgmental, discretionary, um, is the ability to, bl uh, one of my specific pros, which I probably should have mentioned, is the ability to blend these two. I think if you were to come up with a psych psychological personality test to determine, to put people in two buckets, you could do no better than to separate them into value and momentum investors. Mm -hmm. Value investors are cynical. They're curmudgeonly. They don't believe a word you say. They think disaster's around the corner. Momentum investors, happy, right? Short term. It is very hard for a person to blend those two, and I actually think it's one of the strengths of some quantitative techniques that it can do that. Well, let me add that I think that um, for, for specific markets, certain techniques are particularly well suited and others aren't. And uh, it depends on the nature of the market, uh, the nature of the particular assets that you're talking about. For example, real estate uh, has the aspect that it's highly illiquid. And as a result, the kind of tools for trading, the, the sort of microstructure of the real estate industry is very different from the microstructure of the securities industry. That's why I think, in particular, your question about momentum versus mean reversion, if you think about uh, the whole point of mean reversion. Mean reversion is a phenomenon that's often associated with overreaction. Well, it's very hard to overreact on real estate in a very short time cycle, whereas it's very easy to react on something where the price discovery mechanism is occurring at the level of seconds and minutes. Mm -hmm. So the whole infrastructure, the institutional restrictions, the way that the price discovery mechanism works, the supply and demand, all of these kinds of factors, I think, will lend itself towards one kind of quantitative method or the other. And really, the the best approach is to be absolutely agnostic and opportunistic and use whatever works, which is sort of an obvious point, I guess.
sure. Now, now here I'm, I'm guessing, um, and I shouldn't even give this caveat now because I'm guessing about everything I've said this whole time, but I'm particularly guessing about this one. I, I think it's some of both. I think the bubble did raise correlations a fair amount. I think it does make sense as the world gets more globalized that, that, that correlations would be higher than they used to be. My general view on that is your best diversifier for your U.S. stock portfolio was never international equities. It was real estate, bonds, if you buy into, as I do, alternative investments. Um, but what I will say is this. It doesn't mean I hate. I, I actually get, get, I start yelling at people to say you shouldn't invest in internationals because correlations have gone up. And I'm stealing a line from a friend who's not here, but his partner is here. Investing in international equities is a, is a free lunch. It lowers your risk. It's just a small lunch. And what do you do when you see a small free lunch? You still eat it. Um, so I do think some of the, I, I do th tell Tom I got to laugh with that one. Um, but I do think the, the benefits to some of it have gone, gone down. And I think these things are highly you know, conditional in time. They move around. Right? The correlation of stocks to bonds has been negative for the last year and a half, making diversification even better. A, a portfolio of stocks and bonds looks particularly smooth in some ways because that's been such a high negative correlation. So the, the, the true modern portfolio theory says buy everything, and a lot of these things will wash out. Um, so I, the answer is yes, I think it, it got high, the correlations. I think it will come down, but not to maybe where it used to be, and some more talk. Last question. Okay. I'd like to remind everyone, if they would, please take the time to fill out the cards, and then um, I'd like to turn it over to Steve for some closing. I'm really gratified to hear the laughter today, especially in the face of all the bad news that's happening out there. So, thanks, guys, for your good humor and helping us understand the complexities of your craft. Uh, a few uh, housekeeping items. Um, she doesn't know this, but Marilyn, if, would you like to comment, uh, any comments on the progress at the Education Committee? much. Also, um, it, one suggestion was made that if you do have law firms that have done any work in the area of best practices, that they ha might have some language for us. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Bill Brown, especially sitting on the dais here to the left, for putting together today's panel. Um, thank you very much, Bill, for your, your tireless efforts. Appreciate that. Um, again, um, a lot of you have heard of our this new Founders Council that we've put together. Uh, Standard & Poor's was the second member of the Founders Council, and um, I want to especially, again, thank Paul and his group for putting together our journal. Thanks, Paul. Uh, there will be a Board of Trustees meeting right after this meeting, and again, thanks to Andrew and to Cliff for their good humor and uh, simplifying, again, the complexity. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>